Hey everybody, it's Matt here from Piano Blog. This is the third video that I promised in this three-part series on what I consider sort of the three steps of approaching technical problems. And like I said in the previous two videos, these are broad steps, but uh, hopefully you find this helpful when you come up against something in your own practice and you want sort of a general series of, of steps or a checklist to go through. So. Uh, the first two steps we talked about in the last two videos, and if you haven't watched them, uh, you might want to go back and take a look now. I'll link it below. Uh, but the third step uh, is, of course, repetition. So the first two steps were uh, defining the problem very specifically, and then the second step was to find an efficient movement pattern, um, an intelligent movement pattern. And then the third step is sort of the bread and butter of uh, the pianist or the musician's practice, and that is just repeating that uh, over and over again until you can ingrain that movement pattern until it becomes kind of partly subconscious, partly or mostly even automatic. And uh, before we kind of talk about that, uh, let me just make one distinction that's really important that a lot of people don't, don't know about, and that is the distinction between repetition for practice and repetition for performance. And so, in a sense, there's practice in terms of repeating the motor pattern, repeating a, a movement to learn it, uh, and, and practice that you would use in practicing a piece. So, for example, practicing a, a measure or even half a measure over and over again. And then there's practice for performance, and these are really two different types of practice. So when you're practicing for a performance, it's important to understand that you're running through the whole piece or large sections of a piece, usually without pausing, because practicing for a performance is partly about getting yourself in the mindset of performing and not uh, over-activating your conscious mind, not over-activating the part of you that kind of judges what you're doing, uh, judges your playing, and uh, says, okay, that was a mistake, I need to go back and fix that. Um, kind of one of the interesting problems that arises when people are getting ready for performance is that the part of the brain that's really helpful in practicing a piece uh, and analyzing things, that analytical part, really can get in the way, especially when you've got a lot of adrenaline in your system uh, and you're up there on stage. Um, so that part of your brain that says, oh, that I did a bad job there, or what's coming up, what's next, uh, or how is this going to go, that sort of, that part of the brain is, is very helpful in many ways when we're actually learning a piece, uh, but it's not so helpful when we're on stage and it kind of overactivates because what that part of the brain does is it, it shuts down our ability to perform things automatically and it can really kind of hamper uh, the performing process. So that type of practice of running through a piece is probably in large part a subject for, of another video. What I want to talk about here is the more analytical type of practice that would, you would use when you were doing the third step of this process, when you're ingraining uh, a motor pattern. And the most important concept in this type of practice is the idea of generating a feedback loop. And this is where most people tend to go wrong when they're practicing the piano or really uh, practicing most anything, is that they don't generate a good feedback loop and so they have no idea whether they're headed in the right direction or not. And in the piano, what a feedback loop means is you've gone through these first two steps. So you've defined what your technical problem is and you found a good uh, what you think is maybe an efficient movement pattern. And then as you practice it, what you're trying to do at the piano is you're trying to take that movement pattern and integrate it with the sound and the result that you want. And so you, you would play the passage, you'd play even the half a measure or whatever, and then part of you would be analyzing what the result of that was. Did it sound the way I wanted? Did I get the sound out of the piano? And uh, did it feel the way I wanted? Did it create tension or did, did it seem to uh, come off with more ease than before? Did it, was it something that was a relaxed, efficient motion or was the motion uh, not quite what I wanted? And so there's that analytical part of the brain that's always analyzing what happened in terms of sound and motion, and then using that as a sort of feedback into the next repetition. And so if you kind of think of it as, as a loop that you form, you're, you're 
conceiving of the sound and the movement of about what's about to happen. So you're thinking in your head, I want this particular sound, and then you're kind of premeditating that, you're visualizing that uh, in terms of how it's going to feel in the hand um, and feel in the body and what it's going to sound like. And then you give it a shot, so to speak, and then you analyze what that, how it went. And using that, you can then kind of say, okay, I need to make these sort of adjustments. Maybe I accented the third note in a way I didn't want to, so I'm going to see if I can accent that less. Or maybe I didn't swing into my fourth finger the way I wanted to, uh, and so this next time I'm going to try and do that to get a particular sound. Most people, when they repeat, don't do this. They, they hardly do any of this, and so they're wasting a lot of their effort and a lot of their mental power on a repetition that uh, is, is just kind of busy work. And this is the type of repetition where your mind gets lost, starts thinking about what's for dinner or you know some other problem you have at work, and it, you're not really focused on kind of this constant improvement of the movement pattern and of the sound. And so again, those, those three steps, or those, those steps uh, uh, of uh, getting that feedback loop are premeditating or visualizing what you're about to do, and that means what it's about to feel like and what it's about to sound like. Uh, that's just the first step, and most people never do that. So most people play, and then they react, right? So that's the first step, and then the second step is as you're doing it, analyzing how it sounds, uh, and how it feels. And then the third step is taking that and applying it to what you, how you thought it was going to go, the result that you wanted. And so you, you're constantly kind of reanalyzing this process. Um, so you can think future, what's, how's it going to go? Present, how is it going right now? And then past, how did it go? And then using that to get some feedback. And actually, in this kind of practice, this is where things like videotaping and uh, audio taping really can, can be very helpful because uh, sometimes we're so concentrated on what we're trying to do that it's hard also to activate that part of the brain that's listening and thinking. And that's why it's sometimes really, really uh, surprising when we audio tape something or videotape something to think or to notice, oh wow, that sounded like this. Or uh, when we watch ourselves play to notice, oh my gosh, I was doing this, this movement that I just was completely unaware of. So think about those. I will even sometimes write this as a loop down for students so that they can see it and make sure they're doing all, uh, all three parts of that, of that process. And as you're repeating, sometimes you might even find it helpful, even if you have the piece memorized, to have the music out so that you're kind of working in a methodical way. Um, one thing also that I notice is that students will tend to, uh, they'll have maybe the piece kind of memorized and so they'll, they'll start their repetition practice and it'll go well for like a measure and then as their willpower fades and their concentration fades a little bit, they'll, they'll keep going in the piece and it gets a little less methodical as they go along. And this is why often you'll find the first measure or so of the piece goes really well but you know when you get to the middle of it or to the end of it things aren't going so hot. So actually having the score out in front of you can be really helpful, uh, even if the piece is, is already memorized. Um, recording yourself, like I said, is really helpful. And just making sure that you're always on the premise of getting this feedback loop going. Now, in some cases, especially if you're just starting out, uh, or uh, maybe if you don't have a teacher to guide you, or you, you haven't kind of watched enough, enough of my lectures <laughs> and uh, learned enough about how your body works or, or, uh, or other uh, you know, great teachers that you might find, uh, you're, you're probably going to find that as you're doing this repetition and analyzing it, sometimes the movement doesn't go as you thought. So you might have an idea of what's an efficient movement, and then as you say speed it up or as you repeat it, you'll just find, wow, this isn't quite giving me the effect that I want. And that's really where kind of recalibrating comes in. So in some cases like that, you'll have to go back to the drawing board again, go back to steps one and two, try and really make sure you're understanding the problem specifically, and make sure that you're defining it um, uh, in very specific terms and asking the right question. And it's not always the case that the first time you go through this process, you get the right answers to those first two questions. A lot of times, 
it's like I said, a cyclical process. So you'll get to the end, you'll get to step three, and then after a week or a month or, you know, however many months, it can be kind of aggravating sometimes, you'll go, geez, this just isn't working. Let me take a step back and let's kind of rehash all of this out. Um, and that's why working methodically is so, so helpful in practicing the piano because if you've been methodical through every step of this, you can go back and say, I tried this out, that movement pattern wasn't working. I tried, for instance, rotating and pushing here or whatever, but now that's not working. I've tried it for a month. I've really, I'm doing the very, you know, best, most controlled rotation and push, and it's just not giving me the sound or the result that I want. So now I have to take a couple steps back and rethink it. So that might seem aggravating, and it is a little bit, but I can tell you it's a whole lot less aggravating than simply repeating it over and over again with no idea of what exactly you're repeating, what motion you're using, because you never went through steps one and two, and then after, say, six months of practice, just thinking, ah, I just can't play this very well. You see, it's a completely different world. So that's the third step of the practice, uh, of, of practicing and approaching technique. I especially hope that you'll uh, think about this idea of creating a feedback loop in your practice. I know it's been really uh, helpful in my own development as a musician, and I think that consciously thinking and being aware of that when you're doing this analytical type of work uh, can really be a game changer. So happy practicing. I will see you in the next video. There are more videos like this, including more videos on technique at pianoblog.com, and I'll include a link below to my own technique uh, videos. If you're interested in more on this subject, you can always sign up for those. And of course, please subscribe to this channel and visit pianoblog.com if you like these videos, and I'll see you next time.